Kelly. It's great to be here with you. Yeah, I'm really excited to be speaking with you. I'll start with our usual first question, which is, tell me a little bit about your background and why you've decided to run for Senate. Well, you know, I'm a fourth generation Nebraskan, a second generation grocer. I help run our family's grocery stores in Nebraska. We have 19 stores with over 2,000 employees. So I really enjoy working in the grocery industry. And I started actually when I was nine years old, was helping to make change under the fireworks tent in the parking lot of my parents' very first grocery store in Lincoln, Nebraska. Then I went on to washing pans in the bakery department. And then I I tell people the sweetest job of all was frying and decorating donuts in the bakery (laughs) department. So that's kind of my claim to fame. And I went on, I graduated from Creighton University in Omaha and then went on to graduate school in Indiana University and finished up at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. As a grocer, I, I hear from our customers every single day, you know, Our grocery stores throughout Nebraska are truly a gathering place for neighbors and the community to come together. And, you know, they've expressed their their real concerns about the impact of um, administrative policies on them and their families. And, you know, I, I listen to them. I listen to the seniors who are concerned and worried about their retirement, Social Security and Medicare. Is that going to be there for them? And I realized I couldn't sit on the sidelines anymore, and I I had to speak out, and I want to be the voice for so many families that come through our doors. And so what kind of reception have you gotten as you've been going around? So uh, right now, of course, there's a Republican incumbent in this seat whom you're running against. And, you know, I think a lot of people think of Nebraska as a very Republican state. But, but what are you hearing on the ground as you're talking to people? Well, you know, it's kind of funny. You know, the background should be on the two commercials that we've been running, talking about, you know, my background as a donut fryer, you know, my original start in the grocery industry. And so the two questions people ask me all the time are, don't you have any donuts on you? Or, <laughs> or when it comes to Senator Fisher, we've been calling out Senator Fisher because In one of our ads, we point out that her net worth has skyrocketed since she's been a U.S. senator Mm. from $300,000 to over $4 million. And so as I travel throughout Nebraska, the second question people ask me is, how did she get so rich? (laughs) And so these are the questions that, you know, Nebraskans want to know. You know, they want want a senator who's going to represent them, and they want a senator who whose vote can't be bought. And I think those are the issues that we're hearing from Nebraskans, but, you know, they're really critical issues that they care so deeply about. It's health care. You know, our Nebraska families are seeing their premiums increase. Um, they're seeing pres- the cost of prescription drugs rise. And, you know, it goes back to Senator Fisher. Her votes are hurting Nebraskans. And, you know, I hear from Nebraska farmers, as you are, you know, well aware of all the tariffs and the retaliation from the Chinese and the very serious impact it is having on our farming family's income. And it's, it's pretty scary. So I, I hear from Nebraskans about that a lot. And, of course, our seniors who, who are worried about making sure that Social Security and Medicare is going to be there for them and, and their next generation. But they're even seeing a pinch in their Social Security checks. I, I met an 86-year-old gentleman in Scotts Bluff, Nebraska, way out on the western side of Nebraska, and he shared with me that he needs to get a part-time job because he can't make ends meet at the end of the month. He said that they took $50 from his Social Security check this month and $50 from his wife, and that they're running out of money at the end of the month. And I said, how did that happen? And he said, I don't know. And so we checked into it, and it's because his Medicare costs have increased by $50. And this is, you know, what we're doing to our seniors. And it's Senator Fisher's vote, my Republican incumbent, that are causing, you know, the Social Security checks to be just a little bit shorter every month because she voted to cut $500 billion from Medicare over the next 10 years. So, you know, I'm getting an earful, and that's part of our kitchen table tour that we started last December talking to Nebraskans, and then we just did another swing of the state where we were calling it our No More Bowl tour, (laughs) you know, 
in response to Senator Fisher's very first TV ad where she said she's going to stand up to all the bull in Washington, D.C., and we're, we're challenging her and saying, wait a minute, all the, the votes that you've taken are hurting Nebraskans. You're that Washington politician that keeps shoveling all this bull, <laughs> you know? So, I mean, we're getting an earphone from Nebraskans on so many issues, but it's, it's really health care, it's the tariffs and the economy in Nebraska, and it's really the impact of cutting cutting to Social Security and Medicare for our seniors. So I'm originally from Ohio, which is another big corn state, but uh, of course, Nebraska is a very big corn state. And I saw a video of you actually in a corn husking competition. <laughs> it was so much fun. <laughs> I was I was very proud. That was the very first time I've done corn husking. And it was a tough competition. I came in third place. I'm really proud of that. I'd, I'd love to see Senator Fisher do corn husking. I'm sure I could win. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love I One of the things I think has been so fun about all the really great Democratic campaigns around the country this year is is seeing everybody sort of really get out into the communities and, and get a feel for what's really going on around their state or their district. And, and so I, I love that you were corn husking. <laughs> It was one of one of the true highlights of going out and, and getting around. But you know what really is exciting? 2018 is such a different political landscape than 2014. I I ran for lieutenant governor in 2014, and in 2018 it really is a different different ball game. People in Nebraska, and I think you know it's thanks to the Women's March and March for Our Lives. Folks are energized. They're Nebraskans are doing things they've never done before. And I know this is going on all throughout the United States, and I, I'm sure you could talk about it, all the, the people that you've spoken with. But there are so many people that are reaching out, forming like-minded groups, meeting on a monthly basis, reaching out, emailing, phoning, writing their senators. They're getting to know the candidates because they're eager to get involved in the political process to affect a different political outcome. and. So they're, they're meeting with candidates. They're doing things like volunteering for campaigns and canvassing and phone banking, helping a candidate they believe in will make a true difference. And you know what? We see with women. Women are running for office. So some people are, are running for office and that they've never even considered. And the exciting thing in Nebraska of all the Democrats on the Democrat side, more than 60% of those candidates are women. So that's... That's a great, that's a big part of the changing political landscape, but it, it, it's really thrilling to see so many people, I guess, celebrate their civic duty and responsibility and get involved in in the process. I met, uh, I spoke with a woman in Minden, Nebraska, which is outside of Kearney, and she shared with me that she's been to 19 protests in 23 months. And I said, wow, holy cow, that's a lot of protesting. I said, do you normally protest? <laughs> Thinking she's a throwback to the 70s. And she goes, no. She goes, I've never done anything political in my entire life. But she said, I couldn't sit on the sidelines anymore. I had to stand up. I had to speak out. And she said, I never realized that our democracy could be this fragile. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we're hearing from a lot of people. And I love it. I love people getting energized and involved in the political process. So you have two adult children, and I think they're probably millennial generation. What are you hearing from that generation and the, the younger people in Nebraska? You know, I know it's a big uh, college state. So are you, are you feeling that energy in the younger generation as well? Or are people getting out? Do you think they're going to be voting in large numbers this year? You know, we do hope we see an increase in the turnout. And I can tell you, I'm on the Lincoln City Council. And so last May of 2017, we saw an increase of voter turnout in our city council races at large seats. Um, we saw an increase of turnout of about 3% of Democrats and nonpartisans. So there is no doubt the base is energized and they're engaged. And a good part of that is, is young people in, in our community. And Certainly, March for Our Lives was a big catalyst. It is amazing how inspiring the Parkland students have been to all of us to get engaged and to speak out. And they inspire me, and they give me courage to, 
to speak out on common sense gun safety measures, and, and they're leading the way. So I'm seeing that in a lot of our young people, you know, um, the League of Women Voters has been very instrumental in reaching out to those high school students that are turning 18 or soon to be turning 18 to get them registered to vote. And we see selfies get sent around with their voter registration card, you know, proudly displayed, you know, this is my vote, my voice, and I'm going to hold you elected officials accountable. And that is exciting to see as well. So we certainly hope that they participate like they did in the March for Our Lives. They had a march in Lincoln, the capital, in Omaha. But then they had, in central Nebraska, they had a march in the cities of Hastings, Grand Island, and Kearney, and all the way out in western Nebraska in Scott's Bluff. So this, this movement is really energizing so many young people, and they know that there is a lot at stake for whatever their issue that matters to them. You know, is it gun safety or is it protecting our environment, doing everything we can to elect uh, leaders who believe in climate change and are willing to engage in, in renewable resources and go in that direction? So, I mean, they have, they have a lot of issues that they bring to our attention all the time, and I think they're willing to, to vote where they want their elected officials to go, which is great. Are there other issues, things that you want to make sure that we talk about? I think whenever we travel around Nebraska, the one thing that really sticks out in my mind is that Nebraskans are independent-minded people. We always have been. And I think you mentioned it right at the very beginning where, you know, Nebraska is such a, a conservative state. Well, you know, it's funny. It's It's sort of... Either our Republican friends are much better at messaging, or we've just become brainwashed. But you know, it's only been—it's only been six years, one short Senate election cycle since we last had a Democrat in the U.S. Senate. That was Senator Ben Nelson, and we have this great tradition. Before Senator Nelson, we had Bob Kerry. Before Bob Kerry, Jim Exxon, and before Jim Exxon, Ed Zorinsky. So we have this very proud tradition. We care deeply uh, about the person and what they're committed to doing. You know, I I took a very serious pledge not to accept any corporate tax money because we see a political system in Washington that is corrupted by campaign contributions, lobbyists, and special interest groups. And I took the pledge not to accept any corporate tax money for the very simple reason. My vote can't be bought. But I'll always put the needs of Nebraska before party, and I will put the needs of our people before politics. That's the type of change we need to bring to Washington. And I know it sounds like a cliche, but if we really want to change what's going on in Washington, we need to change who we send to represent us. And I'm thankful to the the Women's March for inspiring so many women to speak out. And I'm thankful for the March for Our Lives for inspiring all of us to speak out on what matters. And I think we're seeing that blue wave come to our state of Nebraska, and we have to be ready to to push forward on on the things that matter to Nebraskans. And that's what I represent, and that's what I'll bring to Washington, D.C. So I know that you've recently become a grandmother. Congratulations. Thank you. Do you think that having a, a grandchild has changed anything about your political outlook? I think it's given me just a renewed sense of purpose. When you see that beautiful, beautiful grandbaby, Paloma Jane, who is just so beautiful, it really is such a purpose that I want to do everything I can to make sure that our planet is a better place for her and her family and future generations to live in and that we we restore our wonderful things about our democracy in the United States. And I want to make her proud each and every day. And I don't want to let her down. And I want to be the person that creates a better and brighter future for my my grandkids, but everyone's grandkids and everyone's great grandkids. I think that's an obligation that we have. And I that is something I, I want to look incredibly hard. You know, we have so much at stake during these elections in 2018. And it's time we elect leaders who are willing to, to make a better better future and a brighter tomorrow, not only for their grandkids, but 
for all grandkids. If our listeners would like to help out your campaign, how can they do that? People can go onto our website. 